Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm trying to answer a question that Emra has asked before, like what does media use do? Um, I actually got curious into that question when I read that um, it was estimated that kids who now grow up will on average have played 10,000 hours of video games until the age of 21. And to put that into relation, you seemingly only need 4,800 hours to obtain a bachelor's degree, including all practicing at home and working on it. So not clearly only sitting in lectures, but the complete bachelor. So that means you have two bachelors by the age of 21 in video gaming if you grow up now. Um, <clears throat> so I was wondering, but with all these training studies that we do, what, what does that train in, in, in a sense? And people do that deliberately, so you can easily look at those people who play already. Um, we did several studies of that kind, and this year we um, asked adult men to report what they typically game during their lifetime in bins of five years. I mean, it's totally clear to me that they can't report this really, really precisely, but we try to get some kind of estimate that we call joystick years, similar to pack years in smoking, to have some kind of load factor. And what we found is a positive relationship between the amount that they've played video games and volume in the entorhinal cortex, as you see here. Um, and that was not what I expected. Um, <laughs> actually, I did my first study on this um, on adolescents where I also found positive effects. And I was actually, I mean, I was starting to look into those habits that also may be called addiction and thought that must lead to decreases. Um, then we um, did another analysis where we looked at cortical thickness in a sample of 14 year olds. Um, that's the Imagen study where we asked in Berlin the people like, how much do you acutely game? And these were 14 year old kids. And there we again found a positive relationship, but um, this time not in anterior cortex, but in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and frontal eye fields. Um, clearly, I mean, the problem of these correlational studies is what is hen and what is egg. I mean, we clearly don't know whether it's actually um, the video games causing the brain to change or whether it's a certain brain that is easily clinging to video games because they somehow are good at it or whatever. Um, I myself don't play video games, I hate it, I can't do it, so I'm, I'm really not a proponent of <laughs> my hobby also. Um, I like to cite um, Daphne Barbier, who also does lots of uh, research on video gaming, and she keeps saying if broccoli eating would show the same effect, I'd be studying broccoli eating. <laughs> so um, that's really something I like to cite. Um, so in our first longitudinal study, we um, only searched for people who never really played video games. I mean, that's not true, but we, we really deselected all those gamers and deselected everybody who has ever played the video game Super Mario and really had people who were sort of difficult to find by now. And, get, and it gets harder and harder to find these people who never really intensely played for a period in their life. And we did this because we really wanted to see what, what happens if we give this to more or less naive people. And so we had one group that was asked to play for two months, 30 minutes a day, the, the video game Super Mario 64 and um, basically did a brain scan before and after and that did the same with a control group that simply wasn't instructed to um, play. Um, why we selected uh, Super Mario 64 was simply because you have a two view, I mean on, on the device you basically below see a map that indicates where you need to go because you need to select these um, stars. Um, and a first person, I mean a third person view but somewhat a realistic representation of where you are in space and you need to integrate those two views somehow to be successful. And um, that sort of struck me as maybe helpful because I mean we, we at MPI in particular did these navigation studies where we also used a video game context to build a zoo and had people navigate in that zoo. So I just thought if we go for navigation that might be a helpful start at least. So, um, and this is what we found. So basically we find an interaction of group by time with an increase of the experimental group in right hippocampus, right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and right cerebellum. And we don't find any decreases in no area, so to speak. This is very interesting because in particular that region, we have done a meta-analysis on functional studies and this is really in particular right hippocampus and in particular that region that you also see if you do a meta-analysis on studies um, that do spatial navigation within the scanner um, assessing fMRI activity. Um, right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, I mean, is implicated in almost everything, but it's, it's no regions where you would say it's trivial to find change. So these are the regions that are typically important in psychiatric disease where you always find shrinkages. And um, that struck us somehow. 
Um, the other nice thing is the cerebellum change here really is in areas where you have a representation of the hands. So seemingly they actually really train their hands in, in, on that device in a sense. Um, something we also shortly alluded to was the idea of are the people who actually like playing better at this? In our study, that clearly was the case. So we asked people um, two times, I think, over the course of the time, how much they like to play the video game. And if we take the average of it, we find a positive correlation between um, the desire to play that video game and the changes in hippocampus and in prefrontal cortex. So seemingly, I mean, in a way, it's trivial because clearly if you like something better, your whole system is more engaged, probably you elicit more dopamine. I mean, there, there is a rationale behind this, but I find it really nice that this works out in a small study like this. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to say that other people have replicated at least the hippocampus part of the effect. So um, Wes um, and colleagues, in particular, Veronique um, Bohu did two studies where they also trained with Super Mario 64, one time on older participants that trained for six months, also showing an increase in hippocampus, and another study with two months on the university sample, also finding changes in hippocampus um, at different places, depending on whether you have response or spatial learner. Um, I clearly agree that it's always a problem if you test against a passive control group. So we did another study where we um, asked people to either play the 3D video game version of Super Mario or play a 2D version, which is in principle at many respects the same. I mean, you can't say it's the same, but you collect stars, you have to jump, you, I mean, um, lots of elements and also the characters are all the same. But the main difference is you walk from the left to the right. So there's no um, spatial representation that you actually need in order to be successful in that game, whereas in that other one, it's clearly crucial that you need to find spaces and explore the world, basically. And here we also find um, a difference between the 3D and 2D navigation group um, with a change in hippocampus or bordering to amygdala and prefrontal cortex. Actually, we now have data from 30 participants per group, and there the blocks look way more as we had them before. Um, so that makes me quite happy because I always thought this passive control group is simply stupid because yeah, they don't do anything and they also must know that there is some intervention going on. So I find this quite tricky. Um, <clears throat> we did um, the same study on schizophrenia patients. By now we have also more, but this is the stage where we um, analyzed the data. We did this on schizophrenia patients because we simply thought they typically are known to show decreases in prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. And if that really helps, I was as a stupid hope that they might like video gaming better <laughs> than Peter Malkai's um, exercise interventions. But we came to realize it's actually about the same. I mean, they, they just don't like this. Although some, um, I mean, some, they, they sometimes do it and s somehow adhere to it, but you never feel that they have any passion for it. Um, but um, nicely so, we find a decrease in global symptoms. I mean, there has been some reports that positive s uh, symptoms might um, be decreased by video gaming. That was a very small report of a very bad design. I mean, they were supposed to, ch they, they could choose whatever the game they wanted. Um, it was really uncontrolled, but there they found an improvement in positive symptoms. We now find a decrease in, in global symptoms, um, which is at least stronger in the 3D group than in the 2D group, and um, as compared to a Kindle, where you get also a new device and just read on it. <coughs> Um, then we've done another study and I started to think about would it not be interesting to make a game ourselves. Um, and we know from older participants that they usually perform worse in response inhibition tasks. So if you, um, a classical day-to-day -day example is if you want to go to the post box and want to put your letter into it and in the very last moment you feel like I need to check whether there's a stamp on it. Um, and that ability to really stop an ongoing action. That's basically what you test in response inhibition in those classical stop task um, paradigms. And that has long been associated with the integrity of right inferior frontal cortex. Um, in various studies on patients and whatever stimulation, that's pretty clear that this is right inferior frontal cortex. And since that is um, impaired in all the participants, we thought we'd try to make a game for this. And I was um, also, again, naive to think that this would be a very nice game. Um, this is Fruit Ninja, so you see fruits lying over the tablet screen and you need to swipe them to cut them into pieces and you have to swipe all of them in order to get coins. But what you're not supposed to touch are these bombs. And I thought, I mean, that's a perfect go-no-go -no -go task and that is really engaging. I don't know whether you've ever done it. That I even like. 
But um, the game designers with whom I collaborated clearly said older people are not going to mess up with food and spoil all that food, so we need another um, design. So we came up with this um, Mediterranean cruise idea. So <laughs> um, the, the story of the game is basically you need to um, go from different places here. You always collect postcards, with, which has nothing to do with what we actually want to train, but to put it into a context that older people somewhat like seems to be beneficial. Um, and the actual game consisted of a buffet where you saw food appearing here, but only for short times. So you saw something appear, you really needed to grasp it quickly, put it onto your plate. And then um, over the course of the, the game, things were displayed here that were not to be touched. And in the beginning, it was easy. It was non-food stuff so that they really learned easily what, what the task was about. And then on and on, this got more difficult because the objects that were displayed here were more similar to the stuff shown be be above. And what I find really important about this is usually, I mean, there's a long rich literature saying that you can train inhibition. And I think that is true because usually inhibition has been trained with one stimuli. And clearly then transferring from that stimulus is really difficult. So we thought we have to always change what you actually inhibit to, to uh, be more able to show generalization effects. <clears throat> and here we compared this to a control group which played um, sort of a brain training game. It was an implementation of a Stroop task, of a memory task, of um, a mental rotation task. So the, these typical attempts of trying to expose people to neuropsychological tests in order to train them. Um, and one passive control group. And um, yeah, that was funded by whatever. Lots of people did this and I didn't do this. I took this as a control condition. Um, what we looked at and initially also thought of was right inferior frontal gyrus. This is cortical thickness um, measured um, by means of free surfer. And what we find in our inhibition training group is basically an increase after six weeks of training and what we find in the passive control condition is a decrease, so those people did nothing, and here we do not find a difference between um, this active control group that was actually trained with that brain um, training device. Um, interestingly enough, we also find a correlation between the changes in cortical thickness and the duration that they actually played each and every day. So um, since we track this, it's easy to really see do they do the 30 minutes a day, um, which is in a way problematic because it's not randomized, but somehow people vary in how much they actually adhere to it. And those who adhere better to this um, schedule somehow show more change. Um, yeah, the last question I would like to uh, turn to is that I've been always been asked by people interviewing me and I wasn't really ever interested in, <laughs> but um, does playing vid violent video games increase aggression? I mean, everybody, whenever you talk positively about video games, they ask, but what about these um, aggressive video games? So we, um, I started looking at the literature and found it really, really surprising that there is one big field of people always saying and, and producing studies on mass saying yes, that it makes people more aggressive and another field that is also very strong showing it doesn't make people more aggressive. Even meta-analyses from both camps, including similar studies, come to different conclusions. So um, when, when I was trying to read that literature, my strongest impression was that what they typically do in studies where they do find aggression effects is they let people play for short periods of time in the lab um, aggressive video games, and then they typically rip the game after 20 minutes away from people and then test for aggressiveness. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> honestly, um, that is, uh, to me, on the one hand, that's a clear priming effect. I mean, you show them these aggressive things, and then this is priming already, but we all know, I think, if we are kept from something that we wanted to finish, this classical psychonic effect. I mean, they don't talk about being aggressive, but they talk about the wish to complete. But if you destroy that wish to complete, I mean, I think that most of us know that this is not making people happy. Um, <coughs> so what we try to do is um, do a study where we um, test behavior and brain basically a day before they started training, then assign people, all, all people who never really seriously played video games. So I have to say that again. Um, they play either Grand Theft Auto, which is known to be basically a sandbox game. You can do whatever you want. You can do driving in the city the whole day without doing any crime related stuff. But you can also engage in lots of crime and you're actually motivated to do so, let's say. Um, and there's another game that is also one of these more sandbox-like things where you can choose what you want to do, and there you're building a character. You're getting friends, and you're, I wouldn't say it's a pro-social game, but at least you can feel like you're at home there or you know people and blah. Um, and then we had a group that was not 
um, exposed to any intervention. And we also did a follow-up um, after two months with no intervention, so they had to stop, and then we looked at what, what is the long-term long outcome. Um, we really did, I think, a good job, a thorough job in trying to assess everything that had previously been shown to show aggressive effects or any kinds of effects of aggressive video games. So I've been really trying to go through all the literature, trying to take questionnaires and tests and whatever that they used in order to show it makes aggressive, and um, we find nothing, nothing. Really nothing, nothing. I mean, and if so, it's even below the fact that we should have found something because we did so many tests. Um, in the brain, we also really do not find anything. I mean, I've never seen this before, and I, I know not finding anything may not be so convincing, but these are actually sample sizes that agree or are in line with what has been done with the, those very short exposure studies. Um, and I mean, we, we really did assess massive amounts of data. So. Um, we also did an empathy for pain task because I thought, I mean, it's always being said that they somehow um, get less effect responsive. So we, we showed pictures of where somebody is, is um, hurting himself or not hurting himself. Usually, usually you find ACC activity. We find the typical response that if you see somebody is hurting himself, we see a pain response in people. But that does in no way change neither for pictures or for photographs nor for these GTA-like pictures. So we try to see whether we may find an effect in these pictures then because in that context they've somehow learned to be aggressive. Um, but there's just nothing anywhere else to be found. So let me give you a summary. So 3D video games seem to induce at least the one that we use, neuroplasticity in prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. We find first evidence for beneficial effects in schizophrenia. Uh, we try to use that self-made video game to um, induce neuroplasticity in right inferior frontal gyrus. Actually, that, that is to say, we also did a stop task and found transfer, I mean, they, they do transfer to a classical stop task behaviorally as well. Um, and that was even correlated to the brain change. Um, I just thought that might be too much. Um, and we found that this violent video game GTA does not seem to induce aggression or reduce empathy or cognition. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for questions. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I wanted to have your opinion upon what it means when a structure grows. Uh, and I mean, it comes back to the question when you think of the London taxi drivers who have a bigger posterior hippocampus, if that basically contains a map of London, then they may have grown a bigger structure, but it may not mean that they are better in uh, some general ability. So I'm, I'm just curious to have your speculation about uh, how generalizable or how much transfer is there whenever you see a structure growing in response to, in this case, video gaming. Yeah, that's the most difficult question ever, I would say, because the problem is I've, I've run so many training studies where we sometimes, or most of the time, we find the opposite functional effect. So if a brain area seems to grow, it seems as if the, FM, the fMRI activity that is also sort of related, so we, here we also did a stop signal task in fMRI, there we find decreases um, in the same area, which um, to me is not so much of an understandable thing. <laughs> People have found that repeatedly, and we've published this, but. Um, and also finding a link between brain change and behavioral change is really seldomly found. I mean, I found it um, when, when really digging for it, but it's, it's never really obvious to my experience, which I find a bit strange. And um, my feeling is more and more that these brain changes that we observe in structure are more momentary than we actually think. So I, I do not believe in the fact anymore that this is so such a stable and long-term measure. I mean, it's probably more long-term than fMRI signal, but um, I, I still, I mean, you remember my eyes open, eyes closed data where we asked people to open their eyes or close their eyes in the scanner and we acquire T1 data. And we actually uh, reliably, to my opinion, found um, an increase in visual cortex if people have their eyes open during a T1 scanning, which somehow means um, it might be sort of an artifact in a way, but um, if this is sort of an artifact, that means that when people think about different things while the T1 is acquired, um, that somehow reflects in it. So. Um, my, my belief into that stability and the longevity <laughs> of these structural effects has de decreased, which doesn't mean it's not meaningful. I just think it's, um, therefore, it, that might explain why it doesn't reliably correlate with behavior or function um, and why it may be more malleable. Mm. Thank you. More questions?
very much like your approach. And as you said, you know, the patients, uh, I mean, obviously one would have thought in the beginning that they like video games more than this, you know, go climbing on a bicycle. Uh, but what you think, I mean, uh, what is it? Is it the negative symptoms or what is it? Or, uh, I mean, how could we actually, because I mean, it would benefit their brain, so what do you think is the design? How do you need f uh, to tackle that so that they at least play video games? I mean, my feeling was in principle they liked the game somewhat, but they had problems really controlling this. I mean, that was really oftentimes a movement problem. So my newest idea is somewhat trying to go in the direction of virtual reality and somehow have it easier for them to immerse and somehow without these hurdles of having this small device that you can't even, I mean, um, that might be a bit clumsy for people having motoric problems as well <laughs> in times. Um, uh, but I'm really not sure. I really also have the feeling that there is a very different kind of motivational <coughs> system ongoing that we... of new robot therapy in patients who actually have their um, you know, voices and so forth. And that seems to work and they like it. So maybe it's making it more humanizing, giving them a sort of partner who actually gives you instructions. That might be a way to go. I don't know. Yeah, we have been thinking about this as well. I've done one study where we had um, one of these brain training games in elderly and somehow in one condition added an avatar to this who always explained things again and somehow was the um, first person you meet if you switch on the device and stuff. Um, it didn't work so well. I mean, there were some effects and those game designers keep telling me people hate it. It's like this um, paper clip thing that was there in Windows, which you couldn't get rid of. And they, if, if people know what they do and then there's this person again and again telling you that's somehow so aversive that they say that doesn't work. Yeah, not know. I just have a really short question to your null results only a question part. Is there maybe a critical age where we could see um, effects on aggression and mood, for example, in younger children? I mean, that's something I would, I somehow always have shied away from of actually doing that in children because I find it less easy to, they, they can't estimate what they're doing. I, th I think if they're adults, they, they just know what we are exposing them to. In children, I wouldn't dare to. And I clearly, I mean, to me, that doesn't mean we should well put our kids in front of computers. That solely means there are some aspects of these games that successfully tie people to it. I would rather like to understand the mechanism that is tying people to it and then using that for better purposes. I think that should be the, the goal. Um, Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Simon.